Matthew Patrick, or MatPat as he is commonly known, is the creator of multiple successful YouTube channels. He is a video game streamer and a noted expert in YouTube analytics, but he is most well known for the craziest episodes of his show Game Theory, the episodes that make crackpot connections between video game franchises that make even the nerdiest of lore experts uh, think they're outlandish. Personally, I like MatPat a lot and think he makes good quality content. I think MatPat is an embarrassment to geek culture. His content is Kotaku level clickbait, except worse because it's hidden beneath the guise of false intellectualism. Wow, HN, that's a little, a little harsh, don't you think? No, Joe, I don't think it's too harsh. Wanna debate about it? Yeah, I do. Cool. Conditions. I get to pick which theories we talk about. Agreed, but you have to keep it focused on the theories. No drama, no complaining about how his Twitter is cringy, no complaining about how he gets accused of plagiarism. Most of that stuff didn't happen anyway, but we're not going to debate about any of that kind of stuff. Acceptable. Actual content, no drama. Easy. Or something more recent. About a month or so ago, Matt made a connected universe theory, theorizing that Doom and Kingdom Hearts, as well as Fortnite, all take place in one universe. The video starts out fine. See, the potential problem with this kind of video is that it's very easy for you to find non-canon examples of two characters from two different franchises interacting. Matt sets down a very hard rule at the beginning of the video that he can't use what he calls toy box crossovers. The problem is that in this video, Matt uses those kinds of examples twice. He both uses Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, something that isn't canon to anything as far as I'm aware, and Disney Infinity, which is a textbook definition toy box crossover. OBJECTION! He explains in the video why it's valid for him to use Disney Infinity, even though it breaks the rule. He's specifically connecting that version of the characters to Kingdom Hearts. That's actually one of the more interesting parts of the theory, is why he thinks that makes sense. The Infinity Universe canonically exists in a place called the Toy box. A toy based universe where real world locations can be replicated and where weapons of the toys actually function in the way that they should. And what do we see in the Toy Story level in Kingdom Hearts 3? True, he makes that argument for Disney Infinity, not Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, which, unless I'm mistaken, is again not canon in any universe. Not even ours. Nor does he make any effort to connect the Spider-Man in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater to the Spider-Man in Disney Infinity. They're different versions of Spider-Man. Um, what about Spider-Verse? Which version of Spider-Verse? The original comic? The episode of the TV show? The recent movie? It doesn't matter, I, because I don't remember these two specific Spider-Men appearing in either one. Fair enough, but... These kinds of videos really aren't trying to expose some kind of hidden agenda that all these writers have. He's just saying the dots are there and can be connected, and a proper crossover would be pretty cool. The point is, MatPat breaks his own rules too many times. Bad video. Here, oh, I gotta switch up. You gotta, gotta switch it up. I'm waiting. Switch it up. The problem with this video is one Josiah Carrot pointed out to me on Twitter. The theory is how Breath of the Wild solves the Zelda timeline. Does it solve the Zelda timeline? No, because the Zelda timeline doesn't need to be solved. The Zelda timeline already makes sense. Uh, does it? Yes, people act like the Zelda timeline doesn't make sense because they're too dumb to understand the Downfall timeline. The Downfall timeline is not created when you get a game over in Ocarina of Time. The Downfall timeline is created by default. 
It's the timeline where no time travel messes things up. See, in the child's timeline, Link, with all the experiences of the whole game, goes back to the beginning of the game and stops Ganondorf from ever taking over anything. In the adult timeline, well, Link already saved the world from Ganon. But to create the adult timeline, Link needs to jump back and forth through time several times. If he doesn't do that, Link is incapable of winning, and that's what happens in the downfall timeline. Idiots. This is all very cool, HN, but the video isn't really about that, even if the title makes it sound that way. The video is about where Breath of the Wild fits into the timeline, not why the timeline split into three. We already know all that. But oh no, Breath of the Wild references stuff from all three timelines, so it's a bit of a mystery which one it fits onto. Yes, and Matt Pat has dictated that Breath of the Wild is on the downfall timeline. Not because of anything that makes sense, but just because of a hat. No, he also looks at geographical locations, the story, character design, and the Hyrule Historia. Which is a great book, by the way. He only looks at it where it supports his theory. In all of these areas, there's evidence for all three timelines. He just decides that the evidence supporting the downfall one is more important because that's the one he randomly picked. Yeah, but he has to give an answer. The show is called Game Theory, not Game... Matt looks at the evidence and then decides there's no correct answer. Uh... I don't know, man. I kind of disagree with this one, too. I mean, looking at the evidence, I would conclude that Breath of the Wild takes place sometime after Hyrule Warriors Deluxe Edition, which messes with time travel and stuff, and thus would explain references to all three of the possible timelines. Hey, that's the theory they came up with on Unraveled. First of all, no. The theory they came up with on Unraveled is that Breath of the Wild takes place after Zelda Monopoly. Legend of Zelda Monopoly, the most important Legend of Zelda game of all time. Correct. Second of all, Unraveled is a dumb show, and why do you watch it? I thought you hated Polygon. It's a fun show that doesn't take itself super seriously. That said, which of these video titles is more honest? Solving the Zelda timeline in 15 minutes, or how Breath of the Wild solves the Zelda timeline. You see the difference? One of these is a guy nerding out about Zelda lore for 15 minutes. One of these is MatPat forcing an answer to a question with no clear answer because he needs to force a clear answer for his show to work. Don't, don't use my logic against me. Besides, you know what's another show that doesn't take itself too seriously? Game Theory. It likes to have fun with these kinds of questions. MatPat likes to think about these things and come up with answers to them, even if there is no correct answer, because that's what the point of a show is. I gotta switch it up now. Has this ever happened to you? Aw oh, man, my favorite YouTube channel, The Schmook Network, uploaded a video, but YouTube didn't notify me like it's supposed to. If only The Schmook Network had an account that only posted its videos on a social media network that was reliable in its use of mobile notifications. Well, now there is. What? Introducing The Schmook Twitter account. It tweets out new Schmook videos as soon as they are released. And unlike YouTube, Twitter's app will notify you just as quickly. And this account will never post irrelevant spam like Joe's personal account does. Just the videos, isn't that cool? Plus, it's all free! But what if I don't want it to be free? What if I want to pay a little more and get my name and face in the credits or some other kind of reward, like Josh and Kelly do? Well, it's your lucky day, my financially irresponsible friend, because Schmook has a Patreon. Whoa! That's my reaction to that. Uh, shoot, I gotta change positions. CHANGE PLACES! <laughs>
for my next witness, I call Joe Rep to the stand. <gasps> Nanny? That's right, Joe. How will you defend Matt Pat when the one accusing his theories of being terrible is yourself? I would never! Joe, for the record, when you first discovered game theory, what was your opinion of it? Did you enjoy the videos you watched on the channel? I... no, not, not the first few times I watched him, no, but I don't see how that's... And what video specifically gave you this negative first impression? Link is dead in Majora's Mask. Would you mind sharing with the audience why you have such a negative opinion on that theory? I mean, I disagree with the theory, first of all. Um, Matt uses a lot of information about the game itself, like the five areas of the game, symbolizing the five stages of grief, uh, to say that this means Link is dead. I say that doesn't make any sense. Is Link supposed to be grieving himself? He's the one who goes through all five stages. It doesn't, it doesn't add up. And this can be said of pretty much all the evidence he uses in the theory. But the bigger issue is not the information presented in the video, it's how Matt chose to present it. You see, this video was also my introduction to Peanut Butter Gamer. Uh, who happens to guest star in this video, something Matt didn't do in the same way in pretty much any other theory that I've seen. M Mr. Butter Gamer, you, uh, you appear to be on the wrong channel. But of course, I didn't know that at the time. This was my introduction to both, and as far as I knew, the guy who wasn't as smart just kind of saying, oh wow, that's cool, every time Matt made a point, was something that I thought was part of his formula. See, here's the problem. Peanut Butter Gamer is a hilarious comedian. But he plays the fool a little better than he plays the skeptic. And when you cast him as the guy who's supposed to be sort of arguing against your point and slowly being convinced of the theory you're presenting, it doesn't really work because you make everyone who is skeptical of the theory feel like they're being portrayed as an idiot. And I should emphasize that I love Peanut Butter Gamer, it's just that, well, he doesn't mind being the butt of this kind of joke, and so that's the character he portrays in his online persona. I mean, well, hold on, won't this video have that same problem? I mean, I'm kind of a know-it-all, and you're kind of... Ugh. My online persona is that of a tortured artist with high standards of quality. Earlier today, you watched a half-hour Kingdom Hearts YouTube poop and called it the greatest work of art you'd ever witnessed. I stand by that and don't see how it's relevant. Anyways, like I said, all of this makes me feel that by not agreeing with Matt's theory, I'm being called dumb, and thus it puts the image of MatPat in my head as some internet know-it-all who's condescending information that I don't even agree with down to me. And this impression kind of stuck with me for a long time, and I kept watching MatPat, but for a while I sort of thought it was hate-watching, until eventually I realized, no, it's the one theory that was the exception rather than the rule. What I think is arguing against him is actually just me being challenged to think, which is MatPat's intention when he makes the videos, which is why I began to like him. I'm gonna switch around back there. So, what changed? I mean, you watched a video about Majora's Mask, and you said, this is an arrogant know-it-all who doesn't actually know what he's talking about. And then a few years later, as he started making more and more videos about Five Nights at Freddy's, did that convince you that he was someone who really thought deeply about things? Not exactly, but those are some of my favorite theories of his. I'm sorry? What? They're some of my favorite lore theories. They're dumb kids games that dumb YouTubers scream at. They're dark horror games. Children should not be playing them. Yes, when I think dark horror, I also think of a video game where Chuck E. Cheese jump scares me with shrill squealing noises. It has deep lore about serial killers and child murderers and that sort of thing. 
It's not really lore so much as it is the main plotline of the games. It's just told very poorly and retconned so much that it needs people like MatPat to theorize about it for it to make any sense. I disagree, but how is that a point against MatPat? I mean, you basically just said that he tells the story of one of the most successful indie video game franchises of all time better than its actual creator. Yes, well... You're right, I did just imply that MatPat was a better storyteller than Scott Cawthon. Not a high bar in my opinion, but... I oh. Let's talk about Undertale. Ooh, Undertale, alright. We talk about Ness or the Pope. Is the Pope an option? I thought we were limiting ourselves to actual theories. It wasn't really a theory, but he made a video on it, so why not? I do want to talk about that, but let's talk about Sansa's Ness first. Uh, because that one's the worst crime. Uh, Sansa's Ness is a horrible theory that's insulting to Toby Fox, to fans of Undertale, and to Matt Bat's fan base, honestly. How? I mean, I get that it's a bad theory, but it's not that bad. It's insulting to Toby Fox because it's taking away from Undertale's uniqueness by saying he basically ripped it off from Earthbound. It's insulting to Toby Fox's fanbase because they've done actual theorizing and MatPat didn't look into any of that. He just said, hey, what if it's this character from other game? Which doesn't make any sense if you've done any research. Oh, and it's insulting to Matt's own fans because it implies that they're too dumb and not in the culture enough to realize that it doesn't make any sense. It's comparing similar themes and parallels and common elements through the different games and kind of using the actual clickbait theory just as a vehicle to drive that. And I mean, even without that context, it still makes logical, consistent sense between the two games. The only reason we know for sure it's not the case is that Toby Fox has said so. Not true. The video, if you pay attention, actually disproves itself rather spectacularly. How so? When you speak to the Apple Kid at the end of Earthbound, he's blown away by the astronomical odds of Ness overcoming Gygus, saying that he's going to continue studying the trait called courage in order to harness its power. Seems awfully similar to the same experiments happening in Undertale around the trait of determination, no? Especially since so much speculation has circulated that Sans is a key player in those experiments. And this is why it doesn't make sense. Sans doesn't possess determination. If he did, it would have made those determination experiments a lot easier. Alphys had to go out of her way to try to find anything that had determination in it. If Sans, who was part of those experiments, was right there, then Alphys wouldn't have needed to go to all the trouble she did. Not to mention, Sans is the laziest character in the game. He's not determined to do anything in particular, and he's not even a boss unless he absolutely feels that it's necessary when you do a genocide run. And when you do kill him, he doesn't melt like Undyne, the other character who possesses determination. He dissolves, like all the normal monsters do. It's been a while since I played, but Sans can teleport, and he knows when you have and have not reloaded your save. Meaning that he does have determination, doesn't he? He doesn't have determination, he just knows shortcuts and he's good at reading people. Ladies and gentlemen of the internet, we have reached a deadlock. Any final points? Sure. Like I said at the top, Matt Pat is an embarrassment to nerd culture. He is an arrogant clickbait artist who should not be associated with gamers or with online creators because by association, he makes all of us in both groups 
look worse. He regularly says and does things that are cringy, and demonstrates a lack of knowledge or understanding about the games he's talking about, or the audience that plays them. And the time he gave the Pope a copy of Undertale and expected us to really appreciate the message of gamers aren't violent that he was trying to send is the perfect example of this. That's all I have to say. Your closing thoughts, which I'm sure will be much longer and no one will care about. My opinion on MatPat has changed since almost six years ago when I first watched The Link is Dead Theory. While I understand why so many people seem to absolutely hate the guy, I do genuinely like his videos. I love and appreciate the craftsmanship that goes into editing them and the amount of research he has to do on each and every topic that he covers. All of MatPat's videos, even when I disagree with them, inspire me to think critically about things. They challenge me to use my brain in a way that any good creator should. MatPat has, for a long time, been an advocate for the gaming and online communities, and I think him giving the Pope Undertale is a perfect example of this. Obviously, I don't know MatPat personally, but I don't think that he is the, uh, whiny know-it-all that I considered him when I first watched that Link is Dead video. I think that he is someone who makes very good content and wants people to think deeply about these sorts of things, and he has done his best to portray the entire community that way, and I think he deserves some credit for that. The point of this video is not that MatPat is a bad YouTuber. The point is, is that sometimes the creators we like make content we don't, and it's okay to still support them even if we don't like 100% of what they make. And I didn't really say that well in the rest of the video, that's why I'm spelling it out here at the end. So hopefully you watched this far. Sure, sure, sure.